Hello, 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 what is up ladies and gentlemen, my name is Scott and welcome back to Fudge Mop at the home of Elder Scrolls lore, builds, speculation, theories and even guides when it's called for. We love making Elder Scrolls content but also Fallout content and we branch into a few other things like the Witcher series. Regardless, we love big open worlds and the lore within them so if you haven't already subscribed please do, it's really appreciated but without further ado, let's get right into the action. Today we are talking about the biggest bunch of religious zealots the Elysian Order. If you have delved into any Elder Scrolls lore about the First Empire, the Slave Queen Elysia and the Amulet of Kings, you will understand the story all too well. But for those who haven't, it's important that we talk about Elysia and her rebellion, so we can understand the Elysian Order that precedes it. So way before any of the Elder Scrolls games take place, way back in the First Era, when the men and women of Cyrodiil were born into the oppression of the Aelid Kings, the Aelid Elves that dominated the area of Cyrodiil were cruelly using and abusing their human slaves, and this was a treatment that would not go unpunished. You see, Alicia was born in the early First Era as a human slave in Sardavalid, an Aelid city. Humans here were used for manual labor or as victims of torture for Aelid amusement. Alicia would pray to the god Akatosh and have her prayers answered. She escaped captivity and was accompanied by a demigod called Morahouse and later Pelinor Whitestrake. She raised a human army and by the time of the year 243 in the First Era, she had taken the White Gold Tower and the Aelid Kings were crushed. The First Empire was established and Elysia created a new pantheon called the Eight Divines, which were a combination of the Nordic and Aldmeri pantheons. She would be the first ruler of the Empire and upon her death, she was named by Akatosh Saint Elysia. Her followers would become known as the Elysia. Elysian Order, and that, ladies and gentlemen, brings us all up to speed. So we know who Elysia is, what she did, what she lived through, but this video is about her followers and the impact they would have on Cyrodiil for centuries to come. So it all starts with a prophet named Marok. Now, Marok was not a human, nor an elf. He was in fact one of the race called an Imga, which are ape-like humanoids which seem to now be mostly confined to Valenwood. Now, Marok believed, as did his followers, that he had spoken to Saint Elysia, who bestowed upon him teachings and wisdom, questioning elven superiority over men. Interestingly enough, the teachings of Marok are rather monotheistic, meaning that there is only one god, but the Elysians, meaning those in this cult or religion, the followers of Marok would have to incorporate elements of the polytheistic religions so that their religion could gain acceptance and eventually adoption. Gods of multiple religions amongst the various cultures of men and elves were appearing in the Elysian canon as saints and spirits, so that the Elysian religion seemed to encompass all and account for various beliefs. But all of these spirits and saints were unlike the one true god, simply referred to as the one. So the Elysian religion as an all-encompassing religious canon spread all across Tamriel, increasing its power and authority over other religions by asserting that the One is the true God, but all of these other gods that these cultures worshipped natively are spirits or saints. So basically it was easily believable and acceptable to many of these diverse peoples, leading to the Elysian Order's popularity. The Order gained so much power that by the year 361 of the First Era, after a success successful coup d'etat by the Elysian Order, they assumed control over the Empire. It was now with ultimate power that the Elysian Order would codify the Elysian Doctrines into law. Now these Elysian Doctrines were a strict set of laws that were created by the Prophet Marok. Marok was supposedly visited by Saint Elysia, who gave him 77 inflexible doctrines, which stated that death was an illusion, and that there was a proper way to live, and a process called Elnofik Annulment which would allow one to escape outside the process of life and death. The greatest impact of these Elysian doctrines were the synonymous blending of religion and state. These religious codes were legally enforced and spiritual and political matters became one and the same. Resisting the Emperor's will would be akin to resisting the will of the gods. The doctrines also stated that all are guilty until proven innocent, which is actually a policy that perseveres in the Empire until this very day. But don't go thinking the Emperor had all the power. The true power, above all, was the Arch Prelate, the head of the Elysian Order. 
The Elysian doctrines were unaccepting of unsanctioned magic use. The only centralized organization that studied magic was the Sigic Order, and outside of that, many unsanctioned magic users were hunted down and killed by mobs. Daedra were also hated, and their summoning was extremely forbidden. But above all, the Elysian doctrines are famous for looking unfavorably upon elven kind. You see, the Elysian Order would sack and raid elven settlements, and when the Elysian doctrines were codified into law, all elven nobility was revoked and their lands were taken, causing pretty much all of elven kind to flee Cyrodiil, seeking refuge with the elves of Valenwood or the Dereni elves of High Rock. This was a time of religious crazies. Fun fact, did you know that the merchant class grew so economically wealthy in the Nibane Valley region because of the Elysian Order? You see, in the process of incorporating smaller religions and spiritual beliefs, the Elysian the Elysian Order began enforcing restrictions on meat eating, which made husbandry and agriculture nearly impossible. So what happened was that the populace became so dependent on imported goods from other regions, which led to the merchant class who would import and trade these goods to become extremely wealthy. So there you go, fun fact. So you might want to take a second to digest all that because we are about to get a lot more full on. I mean, this was a religious order that existed and dominated a good part of Tamriel for over 2000 years. So a lot of stuff happened, including a dragon break, which is a little weird and confusing. Welcome to Elder Scrolls lore, ladies and gentlemen. The deeper you go, the weirder and more abstract it gets. Now, the decline of the Elysian Order was a long and arduous one. In fact, it took over a thousand years, a slow death. However, remember, it was still very much the true power of Tamriel for over 2000 years. It is just that the catalysts for its decline could be traced back to the early days of the Elysian Order. One of the first big hits to the Elysian Order was the death of the High King Borgus of Skyrim, the last of the Isgrimor dynasty. You see, Borgus was a devout follower of the Elysian faith, and this created very strong ties between the Nordic Empire and the Elysian Empire. However, after his death in the year 369 of the First Era at the hands of the Bosma Wild Hunt, the following war of succession in Skyrim would cause big strife for the Nords, and this eventually resulted in the Elysian Order losing its purchase over the Nords of Skyrim. Later in the year 478 of the First Era, the Clovian king named Rislav Larek began a rebellion against the Empire, and because of the current Emperor Gorius's failure to suppress it, the Clovian estates would merge and form a resistant wall against the Empire. This inspired Ryan Dureni of the Dureni hegemony to outlaw Elysian doctrines, and he even began invading Imperial territories. In fact, the Nords of Skyrim, of all people, were so opposed to the Elysian Order that they teamed up with the Dureni elves to fight in the war against the Elysians. The Elysian Order did do some damage and made great strides in their campaign against this resistance, but they were eventually held off and resisted, notably at the Battle of Glenumbria Moors, which would be a critical failure factoring into the downfall of the Elysian Order. The Battle of Glenumbria Moors led to High King Wolfarth being sworn in, where he reinstated the ancient Nordic pantheon. The Dureni Elves ended up losing control of most of High Rock as the human kingdoms rose up, and the Elysian Order loses the vast majority of its sway over the Cyrodiilic Empire. Much, much later, in the year 1188 of the First Era, Fervidus Than is appointed as Archprelate of the Elysian Order, and this would be the catalyst for a schism in the religious order. A clandestine and extremist sect of the order organized themselves into a group known as the Marakati Selective, and this ideology spread throughout the priests of the Elysian Order, causing the divide. In the year 1200 of the First Era, the Marukati Selective would bring about the greatest dragon break in history, which would last 1008 years. So, hold on a minute, what the hell is a dragon break? So, just to understand the concept, let's establish that the dragon god Akatosh is the god of time, so when the dragon breaks, the dragon as in Akatosh, time breaks. 
leading to a chaotic dawn era like period known as untime. Basically, it's a crazy event where there is a splitting of the timelines into multiple pathways, leading to many different outcomes and events as you would expect. But then at the end of the dragon break, all of the timelines are reconciled into a singular linear timeline, meaning that there are multiple truths and multiple different outcomes of the same events that remain contradictory to one another, but equally true. But without derailing this entire video, we may do another video entirely dedicated to dragon breaks. But long story short, the Maricardi selectives danced upon the white gold tower using the prophet Marek's teachings and used the staff of towers to basically cause a dragon break. And the reason they did this was so that they could remove the elven aspects from Akatosh, truly separating Akatosh and Auriel. But of course, it caused a whole lot of more trouble than that. So this thousand year long dragon break did some great damage to the Order's image and their ability to maintain control over the populace. The Kingdom of Hyrox seceded from the Empire and the Order failed to reconquer the territory in the year 2305 of the First Era. This was a statement to Tamriel that the Elysian Order no longer had the power they once commanded. And funnily enough, the final factor in the Elysian Order's downfall is the fact that they were so successful. Because the religion was so well adopted as it was all encompassing, this made for lots of schisms and sex, with differing opinions and ultimately this led to the War of Righteousness in the year 2321 of the First Era. The preceding 10 years would cause the First Empire and the Elysian Order to collapse entirely, spurning Tamriel into chaos for 400 years until Reman Cyrodiil would rise and begin the Second Empire. This War of Righteousness ended up eradicating the Elysian faith, with nearly every Elysian text being destroyed or misplaced, and so the Elysian Order, the Faith and the Empire would remain relics of the First Era, long gone and lost to time. So there you have it ladies and gentlemen, that is who the Elysian Order are and that is what they did and how they helped shape Tamriel that you know today. It is so crazy that all of this lore happens thousands of years before any of the mainline Elder Scrolls games. It truly is a testament to how rich and deep the lore of the universe is. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, give it a like and feel free to suggest or request other types of lore that you want discussed. Thanks so much for watching. My name is Scott and I'll be back to nerd out with you again next time.